Especially now that uh, there's a new preaching center here. Где привод? Разден. I just need to translate and just to see where. Okay. Котра привод? Почему он там, да, он должен? Okay. So we can do this simultaneous. to begin by uh, thanking the devotees here and headed by Ananda Gopal for working hard in establishing this, this center because it's an opportunity for Krishna consciousness to spread. But more important than that, is the topic of today's discussion. Because Krishna consciousness is going to spread, there has to be a very important ingredient, which is the elixir, the element which makes Krishna consciousness spread. And that is love and cooperation amongst the devotees. So that's pretty much the topic of today's seminar, actually for this whole weekend. This morning we spoke on one verse from Srimad Bhagavatam. And this is from the same canto, canto 4. And this is from canto 4, chapter number 30. Oh, I brought the wrong book. Hare Krishna. Anybody have fourth canto part 2? I have on the phone. Yeah, that's good. We did fourth canto for a one this morning. No? So it's fourth canto part two uh, of chapter number 30, verse number 8. 438. And this verse is spoken by. Um, King, no, it's spoken by, it's actually spoken by the Lord Himself, Lord Vishnu. And Lord Vishnu is speaking to His the devotees, the Prachetas. And in that discussion, uh, the Prachetas have performed great, great austerities and great penances. And, and the Lord is congratulating them for their success, but He's also giving them another congratulation. And this is the essence of the topic. Which is 430? Eight. eight. Number eight. Yeah. See? That's it. I think it's better in Kingdom. I can see here. It's just, I might, I might mess. Good But I'll usually make a mistake like this. Okay. This is easier to follow. Okay. I know we usually put the verse on the board, but there's no board today. So we can, what we can try to do is uh, I'll uh, begin and you can just see if you can follow me along. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya 
The Supreme Personality of God had said, My dear sons of the King, I am very much pleased by the friendly relationships among you. All of you are engaged in one occupation, devotional service. I am so pleased by your mutual friendship that I wish you all good fortune. Now you may take a benediction from me. Please repeat the Supreme Personality of God has said. My dear sons of the King, I'm very much pleased by the friendly relations among you. All of you are engaged in one occupation, devotional service. I'm so pleased with your mutual friendship that I wish you all good fortune. Now you may ask a benediction of me. Srila Prabhupada's purport. Since the sons of King Prachina Barhisha were all united in Krishna consciousness, the Lord was very pleased with them. 
each and every one of the sons of King Pachita was an individual soul, but they were united in offering transcendental service to the Lord. The unity of the individual souls attempting to satisfy the Supreme Lord or rendering service to the Lord is real unity. In the material world, such unity is not possible. Even though people may officially unite, they all have different interests. In the United Nations, for instance, all the nations have particular national ambitions, and consequently, they cannot be united. This unity between individual souls is so strong within this material world that even in a society of Krishna consciousness, members sometimes appear disunited due to having differences of opinions and leaning towards material things. Actually, in Krishna consciousness, there cannot be two opinions. There is only one, to serve Krishna to one's best ability. If there is some disagreement over service, such disagreement is to be taken as spiritual. Those who are actually engaged in the service of the Supreme Personality of Godhead cannot be disunited in any circumstance. This makes the Supreme Personality of Godhead very happy and willing to award all kinds of benedictions to his devotees, as indicated in this verse. We can see that the Lord is immediately prepared to award all benedictions to the sons of King Prajna Bhartisha. Shri Chaitanya Manovishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Svayam Rupa Gadam Mayam Dadati Svam Padantika Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Adaita Gadara Shiva Sadigora Tarinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare This is an interesting verse. This is the verse that we can turn to in the sea. Sometimes it says that, uh, how do you please Krishna? I mean, there's different ways to... And we say that Krishna is pleased and by the sincere desire of a person to offer service. The Lord is not difficult to please, but at the same time, it takes a different type, a special type of mood to please the Lord. And that one wants to please the Lord. By wanting to please the Lord, in one's attempt to serve the Lord and please the Lord, the Lord is pleased. But then again, just like any person you see in this world, you may see that they have different ways of being pleased. You say a kind word to them and may invoke some kind of pleasure, some satisfaction, and maybe some reciprocation on their part. But maybe if you do something to someone they love and that's very satisfying and very pleasing, then it evokes a greater type of pleasure from that person. So we see in this world that people may be pleased in different ways. But here in this verse, this is the ultimate principle of pleasing the Lord. And what is that? That they're, they're nine brothers, and they're sons of a great king. And you know, when you're a sons of a son of someone who is quite powerful and popular, opulent, has many resources, you have material things. Um, a lot of times when people have material things, they have this tendency to become a little bit uh, proud or a little bit, what we may say, not so enthusiastic to work together in a cooperative spirit because they've been given something from the time of their birth. It's called a fortunate child. <laughs> But we see in this case that although they had great opulences, good births, good facilities, everything, 
They underwent severe austerities. Lord Shiva was very pleased with them. And Shiva expressed his pleasure in so many ways. But after Shiva expressed his pleasure, Krishna wanted to do the same thing. He came forward and said, thank you. The Lord said, thank you. Isn't that wonderful? When even the Lord says, thank you. If someone, an ordinary person, says thank you to someone, it depends. Sometimes we just take it as ordinary parlance and it just becomes a whole way of interaction. But when someone says thank you from the heart, you can feel that. And somebody really wants to thank you. And they're expressing that feeling, but they say it in very simple words, thank you. It has a certain effect upon you. And you feel like, wow, everything I did was worth it. That person was very really pleased and they showed their pleasure in this way. Krishna is doing that in us. When the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the source of everything, the cause of all causes, the most powerful force in existence, is pleased with the person, but not only pleased, really pleased, you can imagine how fortunate a person's life becomes. They have achieved the success in life. And here, Krishna is not only pleased, he says thank you, but he doesn't stop there. He says, ask me something, whatever you want. I'm willing to give you, just make a request. When Sometimes when someone does something and pleases you, and immediately you start to think, how can I reciprocate? And if you have some abilities, or you have some, some ways in your life that you're good at, you think, maybe I should do something for that person to reciprocate. Maybe I'll give a donation, or cook them or something, or try to figure out what something about them that they need, and I'll try to fulfill that desire, that need for that person. So there's a kind of an element of wanting to please when someone is pleased with you. So Krishna is really wants to go out of his way. And think about this, the Supreme Personality of God, that God himself, the source of all things, is pleased and says, take a meditation. I mean, it's not a small thing. It's, it's, it's a great thing. It's a real great thing. And and why is he pleased? Well, it's just two words, mutual friendship. <coughs> because you're working together in a friendly way in order to serve me, I'm happy. It's not like when a person does some service and it pleases the Lord, that's nice. But when devotees come together and serve the Lord in a friendly, cooperative way, that creates greater pleasure for the Lord. And it creates greater, what we say, success in the execution of one's devotional service. Prabhupada makes a nice, purple, a nice statement in the purple, which is very interesting. He says sometimes, he uses the word sometimes, sometimes we see that there apparently is some disunity even in spiritual circles. And he says that disunity, he gives two opinions of what this disunity is. Differences of opinion. I want to serve this way and you want to serve that way. But therefore it is a different vision sometimes on how best to serve. But that Prabhupada said, although that appears to be a kind of disunity, it's not. Because the goal is the same. What is that goal to serve Krishna? Because the goal is to serve Krishna, and the varieties of how people want to express that service is also a type of unity, although it can be looked seen as disunity. And then Prabhupada goes out and explains that in the material world, people cannot unite. Even though they come together in an official way, and he gives the example of the United Nations, a great attempt on a world level to bring about some kind of cooperation to stem the, the what we say, the tide of hostilities and war in the world. A great, great effort. This was done after World War 
One, I think World War II. First there was NATO after World War I, after World War II came the United Nations. Two gigantic wars that destroyed millions and millions of lives, thinking how can we prevent this from happening in the future. So, so sincere, motivated people who have some altruistic and concern about people in the world and want peace came together, political powerful people, let's create the United Nations. So they did. And you can see, you can go to New York and you'll see the United Nations building. There's hundreds of flags. But Prabhupada says, even though they create a type of unity, there's always this unity. Why? Because the center is not the same. The center is my interest. And everyone comes together in order to fulfill their own interests in a greater way. So therefore, he says, in the material world, although people try to bring about unity because individual interests are separate from the, the broader interests, that's disunity. Whereas in spiritual circles, although there may be some differences of opinion, the goal is the same, to, to please Krishna. The goal is the same, to please Krishna. Now, if the goal is not to please Krishna, but to cooperate together in such a way that Krishna is pleased by that service, that is another form of disunity. <coughs> so, the word is sometimes we say unity in diversity. In the material world, people cannot create unity so what happens is they change, you find more and more and more and more groups being formulated. This group, that group, this group, this group. So diversity just continues because there's no unity. But once unity is there, you can have so many different types of groups and they can all be united because the goal is the same. So then Prabhupada goes on and makes another point and he says, sometimes there's disunity even in spiritual circles. Why? Because leaning towards material tendencies. In other words, one's material desires enter into the circle of spiritual activities and sort of divert one's attention away from the goal a little bit. In other words, one is trying to still fulfill some material desires through spiritual activities. So making that point, Prabhupada said, this appears to be disunity. But as long as one keeps focus on the goal to please the Supreme Lord and to cooperate with others to do and who are doing the same thing, although these things may be there, they're not they will not cause this unity. So this is an interesting point because success in anything is cooperation. We were talking about this this morning. Operation means to perform an activity in order to get a result on a, on a broad level. And co means together. Co means together. And Prabhupada made a very nice statement um, it was very, it's a fundamental statement, it's something somewhat of a landmark statement Prabhupada made. And he made it just to show how to please him. He said, you'll show your love for me by how much you work together in a cooperative spirit to push on this Krishna consciousness away. So we see there is diversity, diversity in how one can serve. One is serving as a cook, one is serving as a mechanic, one is serving as a preacher, one is serving as a, a farmer. There's so many diversities, but the goal is one. And therefore there is never any envy or animosity or what we say negative competitive spirit. Prabhupada makes a nice point. And he, he explains that in the spiritual world, and this is a nice point, he says the gopis of Vrindavan, they're all engaged in trying to serve Krishna. 
So one gopi is doing some wonderful service and Krishna is really pleased. And another gopi, she's appreciating that gopi's service and says, Oh, that gopi is serving so Krishna so nicely. Let me try to do better. I want to do better than she did. And who gains? Krishna. Krishna becomes the benefactor when there is a competition to try to serve him more or try to serve him better. And there's no mean spirit, there's no envy, there's no enmity. It's about appreciating other person's service, but at the same time trying to do better in your own service. And there's a kind of a competition. I think we saw that in our Krishna consciousness movement book distribution. The boys were thinking, oh, I'm going to be the top book distributor. And so there was some fierce competitions around the world. <laughs> I mean, the competition was so intense in 1975, which was the biggest year for book distribution in the history of ISKCON. I think more than four or five million books went out in that year, a million. And that was mostly in the United States at that time. And the competition got so fierce that devotees would serve, they would, in the morning they would get up, take their breakfast, and go out all day, and they would come back maybe one o'clock in the evening, one o'clock in the morning, the next morning, go to sleep, get up, chant some rounds, and go out again. It went out like day after day. Everyone's trying to beat somebody else. But there, I guess there was, we weren't all pure devotees at the time. <laughs> so there was some little tendencies of trying to like, thinking, hope, I hope somebody steals his book so I can beat him or something like that. Not really, it wasn't, it wasn't really mean-spirited, mean but it was always like, I wanted to be first. So. And so there was a lot of competition. You know, there was one devotee who was distributing 300 big books a day. 300 Bhagavad Gita's a day. <laughs> Not just giving them out, getting money for each one of them. So, so there was, this was this, this competition. And Prabhupada, he encouraged that. Because he knew who was going to benefit the conditioned souls. The conditioned souls are going to get more and more opportunities to read you know, transcendental literature and become Krishna conscious. So that kind of competition, or that kind of what we say, uh, apparent, apparent competition is transcendental and spiritual because it's directed in the right way. But when there is a difference of, what we say, goal, if it's about me getting something, a position, powerful, getting some accolades, getting some recognition, getting some praise, getting some position, that element is material and causes a division. As soon as the meism comes in, it's about me. And it's not about you or about God, it's about me. And then that pollutes the whole atmosphere. So sometimes we have to see what will please Krishna, what will please the spiritual master, what will be in such a way that everyone benefits. So that sometimes that is putting aside one's own interest for a greater interest. But it's in the interesting point is the greater interest is actually an individual interest too. Because when you give up individual interest, you don't put aside the greater interest. You have your interest, you, you actually bring your interest in through success of the greater interest. And here's the example. The projectors work together so nicely to serve the Lord that the Lord said, I'm pleased. Take some benediction. Anything you want. So therefore, when the Lord is pleased with your one, one service, everything is successful. That is the goal of spiritual life. The goal of spiritual life is to please the Lord. And to please the Lord in such a way that the Lord is reciprocates with the devotee in such a way that the, the devotee feels happy. The devotee feels nourished by the Lord's mercy. 
spiritually nourished, spiritually enlightened, and free from the anxieties that come by way of the struggles in this material world. I'll give you a nice story. This is a very, this is an archetype. It's kind of an interesting story because it sort of illustrates how cooperation works. I've heard this story a few times, and the history of the story goes back to some place in Europe, I'm not sure which part of Europe, but there was a monastery, a Christian monastery, which was a very successful, flourishing monastery. You want to hear the story? Yes. Okay. yes. Just checking. And in that monastery, people were coming just to see the monastery. It was a beautiful monastery. There were many brothers in the monastery. It was flourishing. And more brothers would come and eventually come and become part of the monastery. It grew. And people were coming just to see what it was like. This went on for some time, but then the element of time did a reverse. Things started to change. And things started to go down. Some of the brothers started to leave, and gradually less and less people started to come. And pretty soon, after a few years, there was only six brothers left in the whole monastery, and hardly anybody was coming. Complete opposite. So, there was some word that a very important, very respectable, very influential rabbi, a Jewish rabbi, was traveling in the area. So the brothers, they were a little concerned. We used to have a wonderful monastery. Now look at us. What has happened? So they got together as a group and they approached the abbot, the head of the monastery, and said, well, this rabbi, he's very influential, he's very intelligent. Why don't you meet him and see if he can help us and find out what is wrong, or maybe he can give us some solution, how we can again grow. So the abbot thought it was a good idea. So he went, and he found a rabbi, and they had a meeting, and they talked. And in the course of the discussion, the abbot asked him, explaining their situation, what can we do? We're coming to you. We know you have great religious and spiritual knowledge. Please give us some advice. He thought, he was a very thoughtful person. He said, I don't know exactly what I can tell you, but I can tell you something very significant. One of the brothers that's in your uh, monastery is the Messiah. He is the chosen person by God. And then the abbot said, well, which one? He says, I can't say. But one of them is. And so, the discussion ended. The abbot returns. The brothers are eager to hear what was the discussion. They gather around. The abbot sits down. He explains what they talked about. And he said, did, did, did he... Did he give some idea? Did he give some solution? Well, he did say one thing. He says that actually one of you is the Messiah. So they're looking at each other. Well, which one? He didn't say. So now, all of a sudden, this stirs a type of thought in everyone's mind. Hmm. Which one, which one of us is the Messiah? That's important. So now, what happens is each and all of the brothers are starting to see each other a little differently. Not sure which one is the Messiah. They're treating each other now in a different way. Before it was an ordinary, just things going on, sometimes very critical. And now everyone was looking at each other and looking for the good qualities. Oh, Brother John, 
he criticizes a lot, but he's right. Uh, Brother Paul, he sleeps a lot, but he works hard. So in other words, rather than seeing the faults, they were starting to look for the good qualities. And this went on after some time. And in trying to find the good qualities in each other, they started to serve each other. Just to be sure that we weren't going to commit any offense to the Messiah, whoever he is. So as this mood of individual service started to grow amongst them, all of a sudden things started to change and people started to come back and more brothers started to join and the monastery started to again become flourish. Now the point of this story, which is an archetype, it's, it's a principle that's being taught is that when there is love and cooperation amongst the devotees, things become wonderful. Well, things become wonderful. And it's not, it's, it's not even great talents or great abilities or great thinking. It's simply that mood of wanting to serve Krishna by wanting to serve his devotees in such a way that there is a, a friendship that develops within that service mood, in such a way that one starts to feel and regard others as more important than themselves. <laughs> this is this is Vaishnava culture. This is actually Krishna consciousness. To appreciate and to serve others in the mood of serving the Supreme Personality. And as Krishna says, one who says he's my devotee is not my devotee. <laughs> one who says he's the devotee of my devotee actually becomes my devotee. So one who serves others in such a way, in a cooperative spirit, well, what does cooperation mean? Cooperation takes the form of two aspects. One, cooperation means to do something, to serve, and cooperation means to, uh, to love, to do it in a spirit of wanting to show affection and love for others. This is Vaishnava circles. When this happens, or when this element starts to develop, I remember, this is, I'm just telling the opposite story. There was one man, he was coming to one of our temples. He was in Dallas, Texas, in America. The man was coming regularly. And uh, he was coming for years. He would come and visit, take prasad, take part in the functions. But he really didn't go beyond that. So after some time, the devotees were saying, well, maybe, you know, maybe he, he should join. <laughs> he looks like he's, a, you know, he's been coming for a while, and then about to make, take the next step. So they approached him and said, well, why don't you, I don't know, why don't you become a devotee? Why don't you become more active? He said something. He said, you know, I see how you treat your guests, and I see how you treat each other. I'd rather remain a guest. <laughs> Quite shocking. <laughs> Quite shocking. And we have a tendency to treat guests very nicely. <laughs> when we, when we, once they come in, the mood starts to change. It becomes less ordinary, more familiar, less appreciative. So um, that's why Prabhupada made that statement. He says, the more you learn to cooperate in a loving spirit, the more I am pleased that the spiritual master is pleased, then and there's nothing else to aspire for. So I made some, I have some notes here that I took during a seminar that I attended many years ago. Um, here's um, when Lord Chaitanya was here, he never liked to be known as the Supreme Personality of God. Because he was here to, to spread Krishna consciousness in the role of a devotee. And many people at that time, and still, you would still see that, and people practice spiritual life and have the idea that the living entity is the Supreme. 
because the Supreme is one, and we're all part of the Supreme, therefore we're all one, we're all the Supreme. And the idea is that the living entity, who is the Supreme, becomes covered by the material energy and forgets that it's Supreme. So the process of spiritual practice means to, again, reawaken your position as being the Supreme. That's called Mayabad philosophy. And of course, it's against the absolute principle. Nityo nityanam chaitanas chaitanam nameko baho nama vidadati kama. There's one eternal who is maintaining all the other eternals. So everyone is eternal, but there's one who is the source of all their eternals. And echo bahunam vidadati kama. No one is equal to, no one is greater to that. There's only one. But everyone else is also, what we say, part of that supreme. So in one sense, they are also the absolute truth, but as a particle of the absolute truth and not the supreme absolute truth. So Lord Chaitanya, although he was the supreme person down in Godhead, he didn't like to be called God because he knew this, this idea was being misused. So although he was not God, he was God, he didn't want to be called God. But one time, well, of course he did it a few times, but this was one outstanding time in uh, Navadweep, in the house of Sri Thakur, the Lord came, and he came in his majestic mood. He came as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He sat on the throne of the uh, of Sri Thakur's altar. There were shilas on the throne. He picked up the shilas, put the shilas on his lap, sat on the throne and said, Now worship me. Wow. <laughs> the devotees were so happy. Now he's revealing himself in his real identity. And now worship started. And he would, the worship went on. They did the whole the song Gorauti Kibajai Ho Jai Chandinde This song came from this particular pastime. And the Lord was being worshipped as the Supreme Personality of God and by all his devotees in the house of Sri Ras. Beautiful. And they offered him boga. They bathed him. He was being bathed. While the bathing ceremony was going on, Lord Chaitanya noticed one thing. The devotees got together and started to line up one after another, going from the house of Srivas all the way to Mother Ganga. And they were taking big clay pots and filling the pots with water from the Mother Ganges and passing it from one devotee to another, till the devotees in the very front were pouring it on Lord Chaitanya, bathing in Mother Ganga. Very beautiful. Right at the end of the bath, the Lord looked and he called Srivas over. He said, Srivas, there's this lady. She's standing in the Ganga. She's filling the pots for all the devotees. Who is she? Never saw her before. And Srivas said, Oh, that's my maid, sir, Duki. Lord Chaitanya said, Duki? Duki means miserable. That's not a very nice name. So Lord Chaitanya said to Srivas, we should change her name. She is now known as Suki. Suki means happy. So the Lord blessed her. Why? How did he notice her? She was the most insignificant person in the whole assembly. She was way in the back, simply filling the pots for the other devotees so they could bring it to Lord Chaitanya. That's all she did. But she did it with such enthusiasm and not wanting any, what we say, recognition for her service. Lord Chaitanya noticed that and therefore he was pleased with that and therefore he blessed her. So here's an example of how 
the Lord is pleased, not so much by power or position or whoever you are, but by sincere service. When service is done in a sincere way, wanting to serve the devotees who are serving the Lord, we become, we become recognized by the Lord the more we become the servant of His servants. It's interesting. Lord Chaitanya said this himself. He said, I'm not Brahman, I'm not Kshatriya, I'm not Vaishya, I'm not Sudra, I'm not Sannyasi, I'm not Brahmacharya, I'm not Grihastha, I'm not Vanaprastha. Who am I? Gopi Varta Padakamalayor, Dasa Dasa Anuga. I am simply servant of the servant of the servant of the damsels of Raj. In other words, he was saying, the more one becomes servant of the great souls, the more one becomes glorious in the eyes of the Lord. This is an interesting point. And Prabhupada made a nice statement. He said, he said, servant 100 times removed. Servant 100 times removed. In other words, the more you become servant, the more you become glorious. What's the material con consciousness? Position, power, control, mastership. That makes a person feel like he's successful, powerful, influential. But for a devotee, the opportunity to serve others is the glorious, the most glorious of all positions. It's the most glory. And it doesn't matter what the service is, because the service, Krishna doesn't need the service. He's full of himself. But if one is simply trying to please Krishna by pleasing his devotee, that pleases Krishna more than anything. This is the, this is the heart of the Supreme Personality of God. Humble service to his devotees, where a person gets recognized. At the end of this bathing ceremony, of course, the Lord, they changed his clothes and gave him new garments, and then they offered the Gaurati, and they sang the beautiful Gaurati. After the ceremony was completed, this is called the Mahaprakash Leela. It lasted for 21 hours straight. And towards the end, the Lord started to, he was very pleased with everyone. And he turned to his devotees, and he started looking at everyone, one by one. Take a benediction for me. Take a benediction for me. Take a benediction for me. He was asking each person individually, I'll give you, just ask them. And interesting, how the devotees responded to his offer, they weren't thinking, oh, what do I need? They were thinking, hmm, how can I benefit others? So one person would say, oh, make my brother a devotee. Make my father a devotee. Give your mercy to my mother. In other words, they were thinking about taking that benediction for the benefits of others. And the Lord was very pleased with that. One person said, my dear Lord, give Makunda. Give Makunda your mercy. But Chaitanya became a little silent. In fact, he became very grave. His mind changed. He became very quiet. And he looked quite pensive. Pensive means disturbed. And he said, uh, Mukunda? And Mukunda was very special to the Lord because he would sing and the Lord would dance. He was one of the key singers in the Lord's sacred time. <clears throat> and he said, Mukunda, he's a fender. A person who comes and falls at your feet and gives you and offers nice prayers, but at the same time takes a stick and beats you on the head. That's Mukunda. He worships your feet, but he hits you on the head at the same time. And the devotees were shocked. When Lord Chaitanya used to go to the house of Sri Vastakur, Mukunda would be one of the prominent singers. These were the, the special evening kirtans that were only for the greater devotees. And Mukunda would be one of these singers. So when the devotees heard that, they started to talk on behalf. Oh, Mukunda, how is that? Lord Chaitanya said, 
Makunda, he goes out. He goes out and he hears from other philosophers, Mayavadis, different types of Brahmanas, and, he, he, and whatever he hears, he agrees with. He agrees with everybody. You know a person like that? There's people like that. And who, whenever you talk to them, they'll always agree with you. <laughs> doesn't matter what your opinion is. Because they just want to be on the same page. Even though they don't agree inside, they agree outside. <laughs> so Mukunda was doing that. He was kind of going and just... And Lord Chaitanya was not pleased with that. And therefore, Lord Chaitanya said something. He said, Mukunda, I don't ever want to see him again. And Mukunda was there, and he's listening to this. He's at a distance hearing all of this. Now, the devotees were shocked, and they, they thought, my dear Lord, you know, this is... <laughs> this year is just a shocking. Yeah. So they said, please give him another chance. So Lord Chaitanya thought for a minute. Now, the, the quality of a great soul is they can be soft as a rose and hard as a thunderbolt. You see, a great soul is not always nice. They are nice, but they also are very strong. Because if you're just if you're just strong, that's false ego. If you're just nice, that's sentiment. Blending those two elements, being very strong when it has to be and very sweet when it's necessary, that's the nature of a great soul. So Lord Saint Tanya was both. Prabhupada was like that too. He can be very strong, but at the same time, very loving. So, he said, I don't want to see Mukunda again. So Mukunda starts to cry. He's listening. And then finally, the Lord says, all right, he can see me after 10 million births. After 10 million births, he can come to see me. So Mukunda, he hears this. Oh, the Lord has given me a chance again after 10 million births. So he becomes happy. He starts to sing. He starts to dance. And he's singing and dancing so loudly and so enthusiastically. The Lord says, all right, bring him now immediately. <laughs> and so Mukunda came and fell at the Lord's feet, of course, apologized. And the Lord, of course, mildly chastised him. But the point was that he was willing to accept whatever the Lord was willing to give him, but at the same time of the hope of getting the mercy of the Lord in the future again. Someone said to Lord Chaitanya, give your mother, Mother Sachi, give her, give her love of God. Lord Chaitanya sat for a minute and said, my mother, she's an offender. Whoa. The mother of the Supreme Personality of God, Mother Sachi herself. And they were shocked. Your mother, she's the mother of the universe. She's the one who brought you into the world. Offender. So the devotees started to question the Lord. The Lord told a story. He said, many, many years ago, my brother, Vishwaru, he was going to see a Dvaita Charya. And Dvaita Charya was known as a great, great pundit. He knew the Vedas, and he would teach the Vedas, and people would come him for him for lessons and for guidance. So Vishwaru was coming regularly, and he was enthusiastic. After hearing from a Dvaita Charya, he left home and took sannyas and never was seen again. No one ever saw Vishwarup again. Lord Chaitanya, uh, Lord um, Sachi Nandana, Sachi Mata had two sons, Lord Chaitanya and Vishwarup. Vishwarup was the older brother. When Vishwarup was gone, Sachi Mata was thinking, oh no, 
have lost one son. Because mothers, they like their sons to get married and have a nice family with so many nice kids. Grandmother. The aspiration of a mother is to become a grandmother. Because then you can be a mother again. <laughs> because when mothers, when mother is a mother, they they want to be mothers eternally, <laughs> and they want more children. So, grandmother is like the aspiration of a mother after her children grow up and get married. Yes, where's the grandkids? My mother said to me, "Where's the grandkids?" I said, "Talk to my sister." <laughs> Fortunately, my sister got married and had two kids. She was a devotee also. She was a Prabhupada disciple. But she had two children and my mother was happy. So that saved me. So, this is the nature of motherly love. So they want that. So when this was happening. I was also, Lord Chaitanya is saying, I was also going to Advaita Chari and listening to him. And my mother was seeing that and she was thinking, oh no, my other son, Nimai, he is going. He'll, he'll become, what we say, renounced. He will give up family life. He will take sannyas. I will lose both sons. Therefore, this Advaita, he's, he calls himself Advaita, but he's Dvaita. Dvaita Advaita means non-duplicious, but Dvaita means dualistic. So he says he's not dualistic, but he is. She didn't say it. She thought it. She didn't say it to anyone, but this was her inner thoughts. And Lord Chaitanya, of course, he's God, so he knows the inner thoughts of everyone. So he said, my mother's an offender to Advaita Acharya. And then, so they said, oh, well, well, how can she be relieved? And then Lord Chaitanya said, only if she takes the dust of Lord, of Lord Advaita on her head, the dust of his feet on her head, only then she can be free. So Dvaita Acharya was there and he was thinking, my foot dust on the head of the mother of the Supreme Personality of Godhead? No way. <laughs> he wasn't about to ready to give that. So the kirtan began at the end. And the kirtan got really enthusiastic and finally Advaita went into ecstasy and he fell unconscious. Marchi Tanya looked at his mother and said, Here's your chance. <laughs> so when he was unconscious, Lord, and she went over and grabbed his feet and took the dust and put it on his head. The Lord Chaitanya was pleased. Did Sachi Mata commit an offense? No, no. She couldn't commit an offense. Why did Lord Chaitanya say that? Why did he make an issue out of that? He wanted to make a point. And what was that point he wanted to teach? One should never have bad feelings about anybody. One should, one should never have bad feelings about anyone. Because those bad feelings can turn into words later on, and, and then of course, maybe even actions. So therefore, a devotee is a friend to everyone. Sometimes a devotee, people will make a devotee an enemy, but a devotee has no enemies. A devotee has no enemies. But sometimes, just like Prabhupada used the example of Prahlad Maharaj, he was a pure devotee, five-year-old boy. But his father, big demon, was trying in so many ways to destroy him. But Prahlad, after Lord Nisringadeva appeared and killed his father, Harani Kashipu, what did Prahlad Maharaj say to Lord, Lord Nisringadeva? Give my, brother, give my father liberation, give him a benediction. He asked for his father. The person who tried to destroy him, his first concern was to help his father. The Prabhupada said that is a Vaishnava. He never had bad feelings or enmity towards anyone. Why? Because he knows that a person may be covered by negativity, but every person is, the, is a soul who is pure, uh, soul, part and parcel. 
of Krishna. In other words, every soul is dear to Krishna. And therefore, a devotee never has any bad feelings or enmity towards anyone. So you might say, well, how does that practically apply? You can ask questions about that. We'll try to answer that in a practical sense. But this is the nature. So when there is love, when there is a mood of service, when there is a mood of cooperation, so many things happen. The purpose of getting a preaching center is to bring devotees together. It's nice because it's a place to come, but it's the place where devotees can meet together, to develop friendship, develop a mood of service, and that ultimately bring more people into that same atmosphere. But Prabhupada said, I have established this ISKCON society with all these temples. Why? To facilitate loving exchanges between the devotees. He didn't say to spread Krishna consciousness, although that's there. He said to facilitate the association and loving relationships with devotees. And that's explained in the nectar of devotion. How do you show love by speaking confidentially, hearing confidential thoughts, giving a gift, receiving gifts? giving prasadam and accepting prasadam. This is mentioned in Nectar Devotion, first number four, six loving exchanges from devotees. So sometimes devotees think, how can I serve other devotees? Practice one of these six loving exchanges. Give some prasadam, give a gift. There's one devotee in America. She is uh, she's a Prabhupada disciple. She's my age. And uh, she's been doing Pujari work for years. But in her position as Pujari, she gets access to the Maha. So she takes the Maha Prashad. This is in Denver Temple in Denver, Colorado. And she takes it and divides it into little bags of prasadam, and she carries these bags all around with her throughout the day. And when she meets somebody, here, have some prasadam. Doesn't matter who she meets, it could be a non-devotee or a devotee, she'll give us a little bag of prasadam. Oh, here comes Mother Nidra, she's going to give us a book of some prasadam like this. And she does it with such smiles and such such friendliness that everyone is happy. <coughs> so it's a little thing, but it's not a little thing. <laughs> because she's showing her love for everybody in this way, like offering Krishna prasadam. But this is one of the things she does. She was out on Sankirtan. And she would go out, one, she met this one man, he was formerly a prisoner in jail, now he was out. He actually got attracted to her and asked her to marry him, her, him. He asked her to marry him. She meets him on Sankrita. She doesn't like to disappoint anybody, <laughs> so she doesn't know how to say no. But she somehow or other put him off. And then, a little later on, Prabhupada appeared to her in a dream and said, you should marry him. <laughs> and so she did. But Prabhupada appeared in a dream and told her, you know, marry him. And because she married him, he became a devotee. And then eventually he made progress in devotional service. Just about two years ago, he left his body. So this is this is her. She has this great loving mood to everyone she sees. So she's an example of a person who wants to spread Krishna consciousness. She's not a big preacher. She doesn't sit there and give classes. But she's the best preacher in the whole temple because she's always relating to people at the Sunday feast, guests, people in general. She's always doing something, giving books, giving prasadam, you know, inviting people to come. Very simple, but very genuine. 
So these are one of the elements of loving exchanges, how devotees can exchange love in a very practical way. That's a whole discussion on these six loving exchanges. It's in the Nectar of Instructions, verse number four. Prabhupada goes into that very much in detail. The purport is about five or six pages long. Prabhupada explains that. But this is what we're trying to, uh, what we say, raise the consciousness, the importance of cooperation and loving service amongst the devotees. And then, of course, the practical application is something that has to be worked on. But generally, if the mood is there, Krishna supplies the ingredients for it to happen. If you have a desire for something to happen, even though you may not have exactly the means to carry it out, if that desire is strong enough, Krishna shows you how to carry it out. It starts with the desire. So we want to please Srila Prabhupada. We want to please him as much as we can by spreading Krishna consciousness. But the source of our strength is our individual relationships with each other in the mood of service and in the mood of love. What does love mean? Love means cooperation. That's what love is. To cooperate to put one's individual interests aside for the greater interest. People have the misunderstanding of what love is. Love means to cooperate, love means to serve. Okay, there's a lot to be said on this subject. And there's many stories in the Shastras that illustrate these principles. Any questions? Maharaj, <coughs> uh, how to, in practical life, uh, because we all quote Shastras and we all uh, try to serve Krishna, but sometimes we misunderstand what actually Krishna Prabhupada wants to properly be, uh, have that mood and stay. Uh, yeah, so to come together and discuss it. The practical application requires communication in order to understand. Sadhu Sangha, Sadhu Sangha. Through Sadhu Sangha things are easily understood. Um, in the, where's that Bhagavatam? Yeah. Turn to the ninth chapter. I think it's the ninth chapter. <coughs> Transcendental devotional service cannot be complete. It cannot be relishable without the association of devotees. We have therefore established the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. Anyone who is trying to be aloof from the living, aloof from this Krishna Consciousness Society, and yet engage in Krishna Consciousness, is living in a grand hallucination. But this is not possible. Prabhupada was saying that we want, if we want to become Krishna conscious, it takes the association of devotees. So this, practically, that has to be discussed. And that's why we come together to discuss how can we work together in a service room in order to fill our needs in Krishna consciousness and at the same time expand the movement. When there's cooperation, there is great amounts of mercy coming from the Lord. As soon as cooperation is there, the Lord starts to uh, show his mercy. And then he starts to help, and things start to 
happen. When there's not cooperation, when there's enmity, fighting, criticism, envy, you can't expect Krishna's mercy. It comes in the form of difficulties. That's uh, I'll give you an example how this is interesting. In, uh, this was in Chicago. This is during the Prabhupada's time in the 1970s. Uh, the, the temple presidency position was open. And in those days, to become temple president was great. <laughs> now people don't want it so much. <laughs> but in those days, why? Because one, you could get really close to Prabhupada. <laughs> Prabhupada always come and call his leaders together to talk. And, something. and another thing was that there was some idea of you know having power, having position. So there was three devotees who wanted the position. They all were qualified, they all wanted it. So of course one was chosen and the other two immediately left the temple and started their own temple. <laughs> They wanted the position so bad that when they didn't get it, they thought, I'm going to start my own temple. And therefore, the movement spread. Two more temples came in. So sometimes it's like that, that this is not as, as, as Prabhupada writes in the purport. As long as Krishna is the goal, although there may be differences of opinion, because Krishna is the goal, there is still unity. So if you each start a temple, we got, we got another 50 temples. So, yeah, the idea is that sometimes People want a position so powerful, so much, that they're willing to do anything for that position. But if it's directed towards spreading Krishna consciousness, it's actually spiritual. Did I answer your question? I'm not sure. Yes, we should agree together in practical application. Thank you very much. Prabhupada, in the middle of the night, Prabhupada called him, he used to have a, a, a bell. He'd be doing his translation when everyone was sleeping. But his servant would sleep outside the door on the floor, next to his door, in case he needed anything. So the servant was Giri Raj Swami at the time. He was Giri Raj Brahmachari. So Prabhupada rang the bell. And Giri Raj wakes up, comes up, plays his obeisances to Prabhupada and sits there and says, yes, Prabhupada. Prabhupada was thoughtful. He said, how will this movement go on once I'm gone? He wanted to hear some opinions. So Giriraj said, well, you know, we'll, we'll encourage everyone to chant, we'll go out on Sankirtan and distribute books. In other words, he came up with practical things. That we'll, we'll keep doing these things, probably. Prabhupada wasn't so much satisfied with the answer. And Prabhupada stopped and said, this movement will go on by intelligence and organization. <laughs> How to organize in an intelligent way. So everyone has something to contribute. So we can contribute our intelligence to how to make organization more effective and more developed, and this will spread Krishna consciousness. If we always wait for the leaders to do everything, one of the biggest concerns with my point this year was 
How will our movement go on once the Prabhupada disciples leave? And of course, you know, the answer is to empower other devotees to take up the responsibilities to spread Krishna consciousness. And so there's always a concern how to empower others. And empowerment comes by accepting responsibility. We all expect that we accept a type of responsibility for our own needs. If you're in the family and you have a role as a mother or father or whatever, you have a responsibility to fill that role. But then again, as a devotee, in the society of devotees, we can take our situation and become more responsible for doing various types of service or preaching or doing things. When more and more devotees come forward, like the question I got this morning is sometimes you see a devotee comes very enthusiastic and there's a lot of a lot of responsibility, but after some time that devotee goes down because the responsibility becomes a big way. And therefore rather than having more and more people taking on the responsibilities, there's an old saying in in America. What is it? Many hands make lighter work. There's, there's this one organization called the what is that group in America? Uh, more like not the Quakers. Yeah, it's like the Quakers. The, the Amish. You heard of the Amish? They can build a house, a full house, in three days. If somebody needs a house, they all come together, they all have their room, and they all come and there's a house in three days. Like, you know, Mahatma there, he's trying to build his house. He's been building it for three months now. And he's really struggling. I told him, get some help. He said, I don't want to bother the devotees, they're all busy. So, you know, many hands make lighter work. Many hands make lighter work. And that way, when we all work together in an organizational way, so many amazing things happen. And the interest of the group is the interest of the individual. Because the group, the interest of the individual is aligned with the interest of the group. And so when the group grows, the individuals also benefit. Like so we, we want to avoid just a few people doing everything. Therefore, if others come forward and say, how can I serve, what can I do, can I cut some vegetables, can I go out to Sanctum can I give a donation, can I cook, cook something, can I do this and do that. And then all of a sudden things start, start to grow, both on the spiritual level and on the practical level. And Prabhupada said, he said, you'll make advancement in spiritual life by how much you take on responsibility to spread this movement. So responsibility is a, sometimes a burden, but it's a burden of love. A mother never thinks her child is a burden because there's love there. Although taking care of the child may be take up all of her time, she wants to do other things. <coughs> but because the love is there, it's not a burden. And so when there's when there's that mood is there, then responsibility becomes the burden of love. It may be seen as a burden, but at the same time, because love is there, there's no burden. Any other questions? Think. Pretty worthy. Tell you all. Right. Which model is the best to establish to a model to establish a life community like this so that devotees can exchange this loving uh, communication? communication. Okay. Sit down 
Yeah. 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 Yeah.
doing more. Material life, our jobs and our families, that's nice. And we have to take care of them and those things. But that's not going to get us back to Godhead. What's going to get us back to Godhead is pleasing Krishna through devotional service. How to be inspired and how to inspire others? Uh, being inspired yourself means check the grounds. <laughs> sit down and when you do your job and make sure you sit there and you really focus on chanting nicely, hearing nicely, in a proper mood. In other words, always try to improve the quality of your job for each day. Never think, I have to finish my job and so I have other things to do. Always see your job as the most important part of your morning program. And as you, as you improve your job, your, you improve your, your vision on how to do things. Job expands our consciousness and helps us to see things more clearly. And at the same time, it also purifies our heart. So, and of course, now this is one of the concerns in the, was in this year's uh, meeting with all the leaders. It was a big meeting of about 90 leaders this year in my board. And one of the biggest concerns was devotees don't read Prabhupada's books enough. Devotees don't read Prabhupada's books enough. <coughs> so there was a concern how to create an atmosphere and programs for increased enthusiasm to read Prabhupada's books and to understand the books also. So that's another important part of our devotional service. That's why I'm, I'm, not, I'm not just giving a class. I always want to, I always want to speak about Bhagavatam. I mean, Bhagavatam is the best. You can't beat it. Prabhupada's Bhagavatam is like, it's, it's not describable in, in any words. This, this information here, it's, it's amazing. I can't find words to describe it. Bhagavatam is Krishna in sound. It's pure spiritual literary sound vibration coming from the pure devotee. So, therefore, read Bhagavatam. Read it regularly. Discuss it. And last year I did a seminar in Zagreb on how to increase our reading in Bhagavatam. How many of you attended that seminar? Yeah, a few people attended that seminar. It's a really amazing seminar because it was created by my god sister, Lakshmi Moni. And she uh, really put this seminar together how we can really go deeper and appreciate Prabhupada's books, especially Srimad Bhagavatam. A lot of times we have Bhagavatam on the shelves, it looks nice, the different colors. You know, green color, blue color, you know, red color. It looks nice, and then we take the duster and dust it off each other. So she make sure there's no dust gets on it. But the books don't move. <laughs> so it's not like having books as a showcase. <laughs> so therefore, your own inspiration will come from your chanting and from your reading and studying from Now, how to inspire. When, when you're inspired, it becomes easier to inspire others. It starts with you. The more you're inspired, the more you become an inspiration for others. And then it becomes easy to inspire others because you're inspired. Ever meet a person who is always inspired? Whatever they say, yeah, I want to do it. It's just they have their shakti. 
and they this, uh, they carry the shakti with them, and then when they ask other people to do something, it's like, yeah. Even if they can't do it, or they don't want to do it, they want to do it. Book distribution's like that, right? When the devotees inspired to distribute books, people buy the books. They, they take them home and they say, why did I buy this? <laughs> yeah, I remember that guy was really enthusiastic. So, is, so if you're inspired, you'll, you'll not only think of ways to inspire others, but just by your presence, which may inspiration. <coughs> to tell people what to do is one thing. To, to want people to come up to you and say, what I can do for you, what I can do, that's inspiration. I think that a uh, uh, proper statement that uh, Indians are uh, my secret weapon. Uh, in this statement, there, there is an uh, answer to uh, what you are speaking about. Carlos, also you mentioned that uh, we should think not only what should be done, uh, and also uh, how to do things. Yeah. You always do that. When you want to do something, you also think about how to do it. Like sometimes I think, I want to do this, but how to do it? And then I'll think, maybe there's somebody I can ask. So I want to do this, so I, I say, how can I do this? And then I ask different devotees and they give me their different opinions. So that's a good way. Not only do you want to do something, but and sometimes you think you know what to do. But it's always good to try to get advice too, to see if there's something you're missing or something that's even better. You see, people can see you better than you can see yourself. That's generally the way that the case is. We see ourselves in a certain way. People see us in a different way than we see ourselves, most of the time. A lot of times, if someone is your well-wisher, they see something where they can help you and you can't even see it yourself. Recently, I had a concern. I had a big decision in my life. So I, I, re I just called some devotees together and I said, this is what I want to do, how do I do it? And the devotees came with good ideas. I said, thank you. So we can do that. We can do that. And that, op that opens up relationships too. The devotees like to do things for other people, right? It's natural. And when, so when you offer someone a chance, say, well, can you help me with this? Yeah, what is it? what's the problem? What can we do? So the devotees feel, all right, now I can help you. So how to do things, even if you're intelligent, that's nice. And you may have been successful in the past, but it doesn't hurt to ask. And sometimes you get some amazing answers that it's not going to work. <laughs> really? And then you think about it and you ask someone else and they say the same thing, it's not going to work. Someone says, I don't think it's going to work. Our problem is that we depend too much on our own mind. From intelligence, which is limited. And that's the first purpose of association with devotees, is to broaden our horizons. Practically, both materially and spiritually. Come on, there's got to be some more questions.
Congress. This is a hot topic. This is so hot, nobody wants to move. I mean, don't be afraid to reveal your mind. Maharaj, everything you said is nonsense. <laughs> Something like that. Any other questions? Dharma. What is the what is the manager in a social leader? Sometimes it happens that managers don't listen to leaders. It happens in What to do in those situations? Managers don't listen to leaders. It's the history of our movement. What to do? Prabhupada gave the formula to learn how to cooperate. Just learn how to cooperate. If you have to learn anything, learn how to cooperate. That's all. Even learning how to do a service is nice, but learning how to cooperate is more important. <laughs> you know what's amazing? And I've seen it so many times. As soon as there's cooperation amongst the devotees, so many things happen without any effort. When there's no cooperation, everyone's struggling to make one thing happen. It doesn't even happen. As soon as there's cooperation, wow, this happens, that happens. This. Why? Because it's Krishna. Krishna does it. It's Krishna. He sees all that are trying to cooperate and working together. He makes it happen. So there's differences of opinion, there's personality conflicts. I don't like this person because their personality is different than mine. Okay? So you might, might not be able to work with that person directly, but still you should appreciate that person for who they are and what they can contribute. Do you have any Mayapur stories? No? Okay. Well, okay, anything else? Okay. So, thank you very much. Shiva Prabhupada Ki.
a u mnoha rečev inače zanimljiva knjiga o propovedanju v zatvoru in na to onako, ne znam, tu bo, ki še rok način govorijo o vsem detaljima o propovedanju v zatvoru in svoje izkustva, izkustva drugih pakta. Eto, hvala vam svima na strpljenju, hvala vam na pašnji. Sada ćemo imati kirtan, nakon kirtana ćemo servirati pred sadem, pa bi nam bilo od velike pomoći, ukoliko bi tokom, to je nakon što završi kirtan, svi mogli fino sjediti, jer dok vi svi fino sjedite, onda možemo početi sa serviranjem pred sadem. Inače, dok stojite i pričate, mislim, super je pričati, daleko od toga, nego dok stojite, onda je malo nepraktično početi sa serviranjem, ne znamo gdje je ko, gdje su pletovi, tako da, ako možete svi sjest, pričati i nastaviti dalje, sa svojim temama, ali samo da sjednete kako bi čim prije i bolje mogli početi sa serviranjem presadama. Eto, hvala vam puno i vidimo se sutra, vidimo se i danas. Thank <laughs> you.